In this lecture, we're going to be talking about full wave rectifiers with inductive loads. So as the name implies, a full wave rectifier makes use of the entire input voltage waveform, both the positive and negative parts of it, as opposed to the half wave rectifiers that we've looked at until now that only use the positive part of the input voltage. So one way to make use of the negative part of the input voltage as well is to reverse the polarity of the input voltage with respect to the output voltage so that it appears as a positive voltage at the output. So let's go ahead and draw a circuit that performs this function. And I'm going to go ahead and draw the input voltage on a pair of axes to explain the circuit. Okay, so remember that the input voltage is a perfect sinusoid. So what happens on the circuit is that from zero to pi, when the input voltage is positive, the voltage at the anode of diode D1 is positive. So the voltage right here is going to be positive. And also the voltage on the cathode of diode D4 is negative. So the voltage right here is negative. And so what this does is that it forward biases diode D1 and it forward biases diode D4. So the output load is then connected through diodes D1 and D4. And so also notice that the voltage on the cathode of diode D2 is positive and the voltage on the anode of diode D3 is negative. So that means that diodes D2 and D3 are reverse biased, so they look like an open circuit. So we can say then that, let's say that we're going to have two states. We'll say that state 1 would be from 0 to pi and for that state diodes D1 and D4 are on but diodes D2 and D3 are off. Now when the input voltage goes negative so from pi to 2 pi then one way to look at that is to say that the positive terminal of Vn is negative. So this terminal right here is negative. So what that means then is that the voltage on the cathode of diode D2, so the voltage right here, is negative, and the voltage on the anode of diode D3 is positive, so the voltage right here is positive. So then we can say that from pi to 2 pi, diodes D2 and D3 are on, but diodes D1 and D4 are off. So let's go ahead and write that down. For state 2, which is from pi to 2 pi, diodes D1 and D4 are off and diodes D2 and D3 are on. So then you can see that the positive terminal of the input voltage is connected to the negative terminal of the output voltage. So if we follow the circuit we'll say that this part right here D2 is on goes to V out. So you see how the positive terminal of Vn is connected to the negative terminal of V out. So effectively what we've done is we've reversed the polarity of the input voltage with respect to the output voltage. And so what that means is that V out essentially is going to be minus Vn. So let's go ahead and draw V out. So again, from 0 to pi, since diodes D1 and D4 are on, the output voltage is going to look just like the input voltage. So it's going to look like this. And from pi to 2 pi, since diodes D2 and D3 are on, the output voltage is going to look like the inverse of the input voltage. So it's going to look like this. And so you can see here that we've improved the rectification of the output voltage by reversing the input voltage when it goes negative. So that way we can use the entire waveform of the input voltage. And that's why these rectifiers are called a full wave rectifier. Now just like in the previous examples, the peak of the output voltage is going to be the same as the peak of the input voltage. So if we say that the input voltage has a peak magnitude of V, let's say, then the peak of the output voltage is also going to be at V. So this point right here would be V. Now something that's interesting about this rectifier is that the DC component of the output current is going to be dependent only on the output resistance. 
So let's define the output current. We'll say that the current flow through here is I out. And so what I mean by the DC component of the output current is that the output current is going to be dependent only on the output resistance, but it's going to fluctuate and the amount of fluctuation is going to be dependent on the size of the inductor. So another way to say that is that the ripple of the output current is dependent on the size of the inductor, but the average of the output current is going to be dependent only on the output resistance. So for example, let's say that for this circuit, the output current is going to look sort of like this. So the average of this, so we'll say that somewhere here in the middle, is going to be equal to V over R. So remember that for a resistor, I equals V over R. But the ripple of the output current, so this fluctuation right here, is going to be dependent on the output inductance. And so the nice thing about this is that we can make the output inductor as big as we need to to reduce the ripple of the output current to an acceptable level without affecting the DC component of the output current. So if the inductor is very small, then we can say that the output current will look more like this. It's going to have a big ripple. But as the inductor gets bigger and bigger, so let's say as L approaches infinity, then the output current is going to look fairly flat but the DC component is going to stay at V over R. It's not going to change. Okay, so now let's take a look at a numerical example. So I'm going to erase this to make some room. So VN is going to be as usual. VN equals 170 sine 377T volts. And just like in the previous examples, we're going to say that L1 is equal to 20 millihenry and R1 is equal to 10 ohms. I'm actually not going to compute the impedance of the output load because the output current is not going to be sinusoidal anymore. So remember that the voltage through an inductor is given by VL equals L di dt. And so we can write the following equation at the output load. We can say that V out is equal to VL1 plus I out times R where VL1 is A and L D I D T. And so we can also write the output voltage as the absolute value of the input voltage. So the absolute value of 170 sine 377T. So then we can write the following equation for the output load. We can say that the absolute value of 170 sine 377T which again is V out, has to be equal to the voltage across the inductor, so 0 0.02 for the inductance, di dt plus the upper current, so I, times the upper resistance 10. So for us to actually compute the output current, we would have to solve this differential equation. And I'm actually not going to solve it because it's kind of outside of the scope of this course to solve the differential equation. But you can always use a differential equation solver to come out with the, the output current. And that's actually what I did for this example. And we're going to plot it, um, but we're not going to actually calculate it. However, just so we can compare the output voltage of this rectifier with the other output voltages for the half-wave rectifiers that we've been looking at, let's compute the average of the output voltage. So just like before, we're going to say that the average of V out is going to be 1 over the period. So 1 over 16.6 .6 milliseconds. So 1 over 16.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 3 times two integrals. So we're going to do the first integral from zero to half of the cycle, which is going to be from zero to 8.3 milliseconds of the input voltage. So 170 sine 377T dt. So again, this is from zero to half of the cycle. And then plus the integral from half of a cycle, so 8.3 times 10 to the minus 3 milliseconds, to the end of the cycle, which is at 16.6 times 10 to the minus 3. But now remember that from half of a cycle to the full cycle, the input voltage is reversed at the output voltage. So we're going to say that this is minus 170 sine 377T dt. 
And so if you compute this, you get that this is equal to 0 0.639 of Vn, which is 170 volts, which is equal to 108.64 volts. And so you can kind of intuitively come up with this voltage um, if you compare it to the half-wave rectifier with resistive load that we looked at before. And remember that the average of the output voltage for that was approximately 54 volts. And so you can see that we've doubled the average of the output voltage. And that makes sense because all we've done is that for the second half of the cycle, instead of having zero for the output voltage, we've actually have the inverse of the input voltage as a positive voltage at the output. Now I'm going to erase this average output voltage calculation to make room to plot the output current. So as I said before, in order to plot the output current, we would have to calculate the output current from this equation. And we would have to solve the differential equation. And I use MATLAB to do that, but you can use any type of uh, differential equation solver to come up with the output current and then plot that. But the important thing is that, as I said, the average of the output current is going to be dependent on the resistor only and not on the inductor. So we know that the average of the output current, let's say average I out, is going to be equal to the average of the output voltage, so average V out over R, which for our case is 108.64 volts over 10 ohms. So the average of the output current is going to be equal to 10.86 amps. So let's go ahead and plot this. So we know that the average is going to be at 10.86 amps. So this right here is 10.86 amps. But the output current is going to fluctuate, so it's going to have some ripple. But it's going to look like this. And this waveform comes from this equation. So you would have to solve this differential equation and then plot that to see how this looks. And so what I did is I did that in MATLAB and the peak of that waveform, so this point right here, is at 14.51 amps. And the minimum of this waveform, so this point right here, is at 6.46 amps. So I out, peak to peak. In other words, the ripple of the output current is equal to approximately 8 amps. But again, the important thing here is that we can size this inductor as big as we need to to reduce the ripple of the output current. And so if we need a lower output ripple, we can use an inductor larger than 20 millihenry. And that also does not affect the DC component of the output current. So the average of I out is going to stay at 10.86 no matter what the size of the inductor is. So now we've looked at a full wave rectifier with an inductive load. Let's take a look at how we can use a capacitor to improve the output voltage of this full wave rectifier.